Student Learning Committee through Glacujo. My name is Dan Rosner, and I am an Assistant Community Director at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville studying Public Administration with the attempt to continue as a housing professional. Sitting next to me is Vicki Dean, and I will let her introduce herself. Hi there, my name is Vicki Dean. I'm an Assistant Director at SIUE, uh, and I'm also sitting in the same room here with Dan on our campus. I also chair our Student Learning Committee through Glacujo, and in my daily work, here on campus, I work with uh, two of our faculty members who will be online with us today, as well as a roster of several other wonderful faculty members. Okay, today I will introduce the goals of the webinar, allow faculty panel to introduce themselves, and then move into the questions that have been put forward by housing professionals. Um, to get started, we would like to launch our poll, um, so if Eric can do that, and then we can kind of get an idea of um, what types of institutions we have in the audience. Okay, right now on your screens you should see a question about faculty involvement on your campus. If you don't mind taking just a moment to respond to that, as soon as we see that uh, a large percentage of the attendees have voted, we will go ahead and pull, uh, pull the poll down and show the results. Looks like almost everyone's responded so far. Just a couple more people. Great. And the results are now visible on your screens with 62% reporting yes and 38% reporting no. Okay. Excellent. Um, as we move through the questions, um, please submit new questions via the text through GoToMeeting, or if um, you are unable to do that, you can email me at uh, drosner at siue.edu. Um, while it would be ideal for us to go through all of the questions listed on the PowerPoint and all the questions that are asked, uh, due to time constraints, there is a chance that we will not get through all of them. There are several reasons why the committee decided to put the webinar together. First, we wanted to assist new professionals working with faculty members. We also recognize the need to continually improve relationships between housing professionals and faculty members. Lastly, many housing professionals would like to examine faculty involvement from the faculty point of view so that we can have better insight in the future. Now on to the faculty. First, we have Dr. Michael Gillespie from Eastern Illinois University, and if he, we would like to take about 30 seconds for him to introduce himself. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. I am uh, Michael Gillespie at EIU. I'm an assistant professor in sociology. Uh, and um, I'm actually a new faculty fellow. I was a faculty fellow for just one academic year last year. I've only been on faculty for two years here at EIU. Uh, having completed my PhD in 2010. So I might have a, a bit of a different perspective on some of these things, kind of uh, being um, asked into this role uh, as a faculty fellow, sort of as a last minute thing. So we'll see where that goes. But uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. OK. Um, next we have uh, Dr. Thad Meeks from SIUE. Yeah, yes, hey, um, I'm Thad Meeks. Uh, I am a cognitive psychologist, got my degree uh, in the fall of 2009 from the University of Georgia, and soon after came out here in the fall of 2009 to SIUE, or Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and I've been here ever since. And I started the uh, working with housing in the fall of 2010, so a year into uh, my time here, and I've been uh, doing it this I've done two years now, and we'll be starting my third year coming up in the fall of 2012. Okay. Um, next we have Dr. Lisa New Freeland from EIU. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am in the sociology department uh, here at Eastern Illinois University and uh, have been involved with university housing for three years, not consistent. Uh, I took a year off uh, and then have been involved for a couple of years here. Okay. Um, and then last we have uh, Dr. Ann Popkiss from SIUE. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne, and I am a faculty member here in the School of Nursing at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. I'm probably the old lady in the group, it sounds like. I've been uh, here for 15 years. I've been involved with housing for uh, five years in various roles, and um, uh, actually just completed, I think, my fifth year with, uh, as a faculty fellow in what we called our Focus Community Housing section, um, which is designated for healthcare prof professional students. So I'm glad to be here. Okay. Um, now for the part that everybody is um, here for, the, to kind of get the faculty point of view. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any additional questions that come to mind during the webinar that you would like to ask our faculty panel, 
uh, don't hesitate to type them in. Um, so first, um, and this question is directed towards uh, Lisa and Thad, um, what was your motivation to become involved with university housing? Uh, okay, I got, I'll start it off, Lisa. Okay. Um, basically, how I heard about it was just via email um, that within that first year that I was here and then I just went around and talked to a few faculty members in the department that had, had done it and had heard good things about it. So that was sort of my motivation to get started plus the fact that you know it just as you, you have to be if you're going to work with housing and become involved with faculty fellows you have to love interacting with students and becoming involved and sort of getting their perspective on things and, and seeing how things kind of work at, at that level. Um, so that was my main motivation, um, just to get involved, and, and once again, there's a good reputation here at SIUE for the program, so um, that, that was my initial motivation. Um, I was actually an RA uh, when I was in college and was familiar with maybe some of the needs that not all faculty would recognize in housing. I was um, involved in university housing in kind of a backdoor strange way. Uh, I do a lot of work with dogs and rescue dogs and uh, would walk my dogs in the residential part of our campus on nice days just to give the dogs, uh, well, give the students um, something to do. They all miss their pets. Uh, and so that became a regular habit of mine uh, and then became involved in university housing kind of in that back door, was asked to be a faculty fellow. But it was very informally that I started spending time uh, in the residential quarters and it was just to allow students to spend time with my dogs. Hmm. Okay. Um, the next question is from Michael and Ann. Um, how can we better motivate other faculty members to get involved? Well, for, uh, for me, uh, I've ha I had a lot of um, good um, direction and encouragement from several faculty in my department as a junior faculty member and they actually mentioned to me several times to get involved. So I think um, you know, the more that faculty are involved in the program, uh, getting um, those who are new on board to, to faculty, uh, getting them involved with such things is important, making those connections with, with uh, those senior faculty been for a long time. This is Ann. I'll answer um, from my perspective. Um, since I teach in a professional school, we don't often see students until they're uh, entered into our schools of nursing and like, likewise in school of business. So they're almost juniors very often by the time we get to know them. So it's one way for faculty to reach out to our uh, undergraduates um, a little bit more and get some involvement with uh, freshmen and sophomore students. Um, and help answer some of their questions um, about coming into and getting to know the faculty in the schools uh, of School of Nursing in particular, but in all the professional schools. So I think letting faculty know that this is an opportunity um, and then encouraging them through word of mouth with um, some of the great uh, experiences that we've had um, as faculty fellows, some of the diverse experiences we've had, I think that has what, what has motivated some of our faculty to get involved. Okay. Um, and this one is for Th uh, Lisa and Thad. Um, what level of commitment is your preference? Uh, I, I assume by commitment you mean just in terms of time. And, and uh, I don't necessarily, you know, it's funny working for the past two years as a faculty fellow. It's been, you know, off and on, like I'll have certain times where the time commitment's a little more than others. but. You know, I, I like that it's, for me, I like that it's at night, night and weekends because those are the times that I have free. So uh, in terms of level of commitment, I mean, I'm willing to put as much as I need to to get in there and get involved, but I think generally speaking what, what I've found is, you know, once or twice, once every week or every other week spending, you know, a night or a weekend doing some activity and, you know, sometimes more than that, sometimes less than that, but I, I feel that that commitment is, is not too demanding. Uh, given you know my uh, my schedule and my time, I assume that's kind of what what the question's referring to. Uh, I'll say too, I think a lot of my level of commitment depends upon the group I'm working with. Uh, I have had some floors uh, in the hall that I'm in now, we actually have particular RAs and floors that we work with. And so my level of commitment went up actually when I had a specific group of students uh, that I saw on a regular basis instead of just being associated with 
an entire residence hall. I got to know them better. I worked directly with a single RA on some floor specific projects. And it makes the, um, my desire to be involved um, higher. And I think the students are more comfortable in uh, regular meetings with me um, now that we have that kind of floor commitment. Thank you. What are some barriers to faculty participation? And this one is for Michael and Ann. Go ahead, Michael. Um, I'm, I'm trying to process it a little bit. I think that uh, some of the barriers might be not knowing that there's actual uh, faculty participation needed uh, within housing. I know that when I went through my orientation as a new faculty member, there was not much said about it. Uh, and so it all just sort of sprung up out of nowhere. I was presented with the opportunity one day and, and jumped on board. Uh, had I known probably uh, sooner that um, that there was such an opportunity, I probably would have would have jumped on sooner as well. But uh, for me, that that I saw, and especially as a new faculty member, was a major barrier. Just knowing that there are uh, such opportunities for participation uh, in the housing program on campus. I think what I hear most commonly from faculty when I recruit or ask them to get involved with housing is time. Um, you know, the um, most of the activities occur in the evenings and weekends, as Thad mentioned, which is very convenient for the students. Um, but for any faculty member that lives a distance from school, um, you know, I live 20 miles, 25 miles from campus. Um, it either means a very long day for me to stay around, or it means an extra trip back and forth. So, um, you know, I think just negotiating a, a schedule that can work, and then um, uh, figuring out how much time you're willing to allocate to this activity, um, and then working with the RA. Um, and again, I think my involvement, um, I will um, echo what Lisa said. When I work with a RA that is um, in a nursing FIC, a focused interest community, um, I am much more engaged with that particular floor without those residents because I know them, I anticipate many of them coming into the program. They anticipate meeting me and coming into the program. Um, so there's a bigger commitment, bigger level of engagement than if I were just assigned to uh, a, a floor where you know, it was all psychology majors or people interested in engineering um, or a variety of people that may or may not have interests um, in a discipline that I'm, I'm currently teaching in. So those are my comments. Okay. Um, next, uh, when working with residence life, what is most challenging? And this one is directed towards Thad and Lisa. Uh, uh, I guess I'll start it off. Uh, I mean, the, the, the time thing has been, we've, we've touched on that a few times, and I do agree, but going back to what Anne was saying a second ago about that being a barrier, but kind of working that into this, making time to do things, I mean, that's always going to be a challenge to faculty, but that's always the case with any type of, of activity like that. Honestly, when I first started especially, what I found challenging is just trying to keep things organized and keep students engaged and have them realize kind of what exactly we were trying to do uh, with the activity that we were doing or with, you know, whatever it is that we were um, we were sponsoring and we were running. So I think one challenge that I found, and I think as I've done it more, I've gotten better at this, is just keeping, um, sort of keeping the students on task and keeping the students seeing the big picture of, of what we're trying to do. Um, I think that was the biggest challenge, especially when I first started. But I, like I said, I think it's, it's, I've gotten a little better at that. I think some of that too, at least for me, um, has been about trying to match what I can give to that group with maybe what they're seeking. Um, I think, um, I, and I know uh, Michael's in my same department, and, and we try to match with our floors kind of what we can bring them. If they're looking for a service project that we can help them with, or if there's something specific. I think sometimes uh, with Residence Life, they have some, some um, great objectives and goals, and we have some, some maybe talents and gifts that we could bring to it. Sometimes it's about matching those things so that we do have engaging programs that are comfortable for us to participate in where we feel like we're actually um, um, doing what we can to meet those objectives. Thank you. What are the most impactful resources and training that Residence Life can offer faculty members? And this one is directed towards Michael and Ann. 
Go ahead, Ann. Well, um, we're, I think, very blessed here at SAUE. We have um, a wonderful uh, Residence Life program, and in my years of involvement, they've had a lot of financial support. Um, I don't know where they get the bucket of money, but they always seem to have a bucket of money. And if you want to do an activity with students, with, with your residents, um, I have not found um, an instance where we couldn't do it because of finances. So, um, you know, that may come at some point, but I think that's really important that if, you know, you want to do some activities or you want to engage in a project, um, there have to be some financial means to do so, whether it's just buying food so the residents come uh, or taking a bus somewhere that we uh, that they chartered, I know, to go to a, a museum exhibit uh, in St. Louis. Um, lots of different ways to do that, but um, it doesn't have to be real costly, but um, it's nice if you can offset the expense for the student a little bit if there is one. So I think those are important. Um, and then I think training for us as resident advisors or as um, faculty advisors is important. What is our role? What is the expectation? Um, because I think that can be difficult for faculty to understand um, as well. And one thing I found once I, I did get uh, involved and, and got going and sort of uh, caught my stride with this is the, the the best resources I, had, resources I had were other people doing the same thing, but those people have been doing it for much longer than I had, and so being able to identify people who are faculty fellows for several years, uh, some of the some of the team captains and and dorm captains and and things here at EIU who. Uh, could answer questions and just knowing who those people were um, and and what kind of skills that they could offer being maybe like a mentoring program for new faculty fellows uh, where they linked up with uh, with those who have been doing it for several years. Uh, and once I was able to, to know those people and answer some questions, some within my department, uh, some outside of the department, I, I felt like I got better grips on what was going on and got my bearings straight uh, and, and almost could, uh, felt like a more effective faculty fellow. Thank you. Um, Lisa and Thad, um, do you have any other um, additional areas of training that Residence Life could offer faculty fellows? Uh, I think aside from what Anne and um, Michael were saying, not, not, not particularly. I think a lot of you just kind of self-train yourself when you get in there and you just get experience and you kind of figure out what kind of things, what kind of events go on, what type of interaction you should have with the students. Uh, but as they were saying a minute ago, maybe just more on sort of the faculty role is, and I think it's mentioned uh, maybe a question or two ago, maybe some more initial ideas about activities that that could be done that are sort of more specific connections between you know the faculty and then the students that they have. But other than that, I mean, I think that what what the health and staff here at SIUE does uh, is is great. You know, the orientation and everything. Um, aside from that, I mean, I, I think I think the training is good at least at least here at SIUE. And I would just add, I think for any school who's looking, if you don't already have a program, if you're looking at putting one in place, one of the key things that you can do is just educate your faculty mm -hmm. on how the residence halls work. What are the rules of the residence mm -hmm. halls? Um, maybe explain how roommates are matched, things like that, so that your faculty understand the community that they're stepping into. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael and Ann, what do you expect from residence life professionals? <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. No pressure. <laughs> no pre right, right. No pressure. Um, uh, information, guidance, uh, being kept in the loop, especially uh, with the level of involvement that we have as faculty fellows, knowing what's going on, um, and feeling like you're part of the team, uh, because you really are part of the team. I think that um, one of the things that helped me the most, um, particularly when I was newer at this role, was establishing a regular kind of communication. Um, and I'm going to, there's, there's kind of two different ways to look at this. The resident life, residence life professionals, the paid staff um, is a little bit different than the RA staff. Um, and the RA staff, the, you know, most of them are sophomore, junior, senior students, some of them uh, very often are in their first year in that their own role, and so they're learning how to be an RA, um, which in, you know is a huge uh, transition for some of these kids. 
Um, I think that, you know, setting up expect expectations right away, um, you know, I need you to email me this or sending, you know, encouraging them to email you as a faculty member, I found that, um, uh, you know, if I reach out to them first, they're much more likely to respond to an email than if I wait for them to initiate the communication. So, um, clarifying the role, clarifying the expectation, and then making the initial step um, because they're usually afraid or all consumed with learning their role um, to help you organize things and uh, get started, if you will. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, this one is for Lisa and Thad. What is your preferred style of communication with housing staff? And I know we just kind of touched on that, but... Um, I would say definitely email um, works, but um, one thing that our RAs do that we work with directly is that each month they send us uh, via email some type of electronic um, uh, monthly newsletter that shows what the residents have been doing, what's been going on in the floor, so even if we're not there um, every week, we still are in touch with what the floor is doing, and that gives you some points of communication when you are with the residents, so that you don't have to be there for everything they do, but that you still are linked with them, so that when you are together, it is it is a more meaningful communication. Yes, and I'll echo that. I mean, specifically with the faculty housing, I think newsletters help. You know, email's fine. And I see on here you also have the faculty students or um, sort of a communication with uh, faculty and students as well. And maybe that's one thing that um, obviously we communicate with the students within, um, within the actual uh, context of the events, but maybe, um, you know, and maybe this is something that I could do as a faculty fellow more, just something more to keep connected with the students, whether it be, you know, sort of a, a regular get together where we get around, we discuss how you know, school is going, class is going, et cetera, or even something like a newsletter, even within the faculty student um, sort of relationship, something sort of uh, to mirror what goes on in the faculty housing sort of line of communication. So I think maybe, um, and maybe like this is something I set a personal goal is to increase that faculty student communication more to be outside of the context of just, you know, when we go, when we do events with them and we go over to the uh, uh, actual housing um, uh, context. Thank you. Uh, Michael and Ann, which events do you find most impactful with students? Um, for, for us or for them or all of the above? <laughs> uh, I guess for, from both your uh, point of view and then maybe from a student point of view as far as a uh, faculty student event. Um, well, f for me, in, in, in my experience over the past year or so, the, the ones that have been most impactful have been the more informal ones. One of the things that I did with my RA and the floor that I worked with is we would have uh, a meal together in one of the dining halls uh, every two or three weeks, and that just provided a time to be with the residents uh, to be hanging out informal. Um, there, there wasn't any kind of a structure to it besides just getting in the dining hall, sitting down, having a meal, and talking like real people and kind of uh, overcoming that faculty student barrier uh, and kind of realizing that, you know, we're all just people too and, and we eat and, and we like to sit and relax and we can talk about things that have nothing to do with what we're supposed to be teaching about. We can talk about you know what's going on around the world, or talk sports, or talk whatever uh, uh, is on the mind. And I think that having that um, just sort of downtime, that sort of barrier lowered a bit, um, was helpful for me. But I could also see and got feedback from from my residents as well that it was helpful for them. I would agree. Um, although I really enjoy the structured activities and some of the ones that I've, I've participated in, I find that like if we're going somewhere together as a group, the students take off and go on their own and you know, they're not real interested in hanging back with their faculty fellow. <laughs> so uh, kind of like when you take your kids to the zoo, you know, they kind of scatter. Um, but when you're in their living environment uh, as an invited guest and you can just sit and have ice cream with them or um, you know I maybe do a little informational session and then have some you know just interaction time I think that's really 
in my mind, most beneficial for me. I get to know them a little bit better. They get to know me as a person. Then they're not as afraid to contact me or come by my office and ask a question or just sit and talk when they see me uh, around campus. So probably in, in terms of being most beneficial, it's the informal um, meetings, the small group gatherings or like meals or stuff as opposed to the more structured um, activities. Thank you. Uh, Lisa and Ted, what has been your favorite event that you have planned or participated in with con or in conjunction with Residence Life? Uh, Dad, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I guess uh, a couple of things popping to mind. I mean, one related to what uh, Michael and Anne were just talking about. The informal ones uh, are, are always fun. I mean, any any event that where you get this close connection and the students can really see sort of the the you know the the, the barrier between professors and students, you know, is not you know, anything fundamentally different. And I think one that just pops into mind that we do here is the Are You Smarter Than a Professor um, event, which is where, you know, we the uh, professors challenge to the students in a game of trivia. Uh, and I think they really take to that because it really, not only is it interactive with the students, I think they really see that, you know, it's more of an informal type of communication structure, which I think they really respond to. But I will say that one of the ones that I think got the best response from at least my students was a volunteer event that we did last year at an Alzheimer's Walk, which uh, they really took to and really enjoyed. And I think, you know, anything that you can get, still have that interaction and that communication with the students, but at the same time serving some where they feel like they're doing something uh, uh, functional and doing something that provides a service, I think they really took to that. And it's a challenge sometimes to create those type of events, but when those do come along, I think uh, I think that I mean I enjoyed it, but I think they that that was the biggest positive response I got from uh, the the students in my two years of doing this. I've had there are two that I now do pretty consistently, and my RA every year says you're the one who does these two things. So they're they've they've kind of started to become popular. Um, and one, it, as I said at the beginning, I started with dogs, and so my floor has doggy dates. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the, I bring my pack up and um, have a helper, and, and um, it is very casual. They meet out on the quad, and they all just play with the dogs. And it, it sounds um, so simple, but it is something and the, the students look forward to. And then I make posters with pictures of the dogs saying thank you that the RA then hangs in the bathrooms and in the hall and everything later, so they have photos of them. But it's one of the most popular things we do. It is that casual time. Um, and, and I had a student who had had a really horrible day one day, and she came in and she plopped down, and my 70-pound boxer just climbed up in her lap, um, and she started crying. And he sat there and just licked her tears away until her day was completely better. Um, and we have almost every doggy date, we have something like that. It is, it's so simple, and it is so therapeutic for the students. We also have another one that I do, I actually study quilting and gendered labor, and so I cut out quilt blocks, and now it's, I have several floors, not just my floor, but several floors that ask me to do that, and it only takes about an hour, and they color the blocks, we make crayon quilts, and then I finish them, and then they get to donate them, and, and I agree with, um, with what Thad was saying, it is that volunteerism that gives them, and it's casual, they're all sitting around and coloring, um, and making, one floor made baby blankets this year, and another floor made them for the homeless shelter, um, but they, they know they're doing something bigger, and because all of their blocks go into a single quilt, it is also something that kind of unifies their labor and their work. Um, and it's a casual, fun event, but they really get to see the fruits of that labor. Um, and then the floor, several residents from the floor take them over and donate them to wherever they're, uh, they're being donated. Okay. The next question is kind of a big question, um, so each one of you will be able to answer it. Um, if you could create an ideal faculty involvement program, what would you create, and then how would you uh, recruit faculty members to be a part of it? Well, Not everybody one time. <laughs> <laughs> I would say where I started. I think the ideal faculty involvement program depends on your students. 
Um, it depends on the institution that you're at, whether you're at a small liberal arts school or you're at a large state university is going to make a huge difference in the type of program that's going to be a match um, for yours. If you have a program that is organized around clusters, um, then you're probably going to have different needs um, than a program that isn't. Um, and so I, I think the ideal faculty involvement program is, is first of all, going to depend on what your students, how they're living, what their community like is like, but also what they need out of the housing program. Sure, I'll just pick up. I don't know that this is an ideal, but in terms of getting faculty involvement, I think if you could appeal, because what is one, one thing that faculty won't, well, they want their students to come in and to come into the classrooms knowing how to actively learn and to use study skills and to, you know, just essentially know how to be a student in terms of uh, studying. So something maybe to get faculty involved would be to potentially you know, have some sort of program, like a perfect creation for this, but something to where you could, um, you know, get these student, students involved with knowing what it means to be a student, knowing what it means to, to learn, to actively learn, and not just passively learn. And I think that would be a good way to recruit faculty because it's the one thing I always hear faculty know wanting more of. Mm -hmm. So some program like that where you could still keep it potentially social and not just strictly classroom based, but I think that would be a, a big selling point for faculty. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I want to add on that a little bit is uh, in terms of um, program creation for faculty, but also recruitment, uh, because this is how I initially got recruited as well, uh, was that, you know, these the students and the, and the residents and the, the RAs and, and the, those running the, the housing uh, areas and things, I mean, they're, they're sort of the authors of their own lives as well, and they come to this with some sort of agency, and so they're going to, they're taking classes, they're doing things around campus, and they're seeing people who are involved or who might uh, be cool or fun as a, a faculty fellow or someone to get linked up with. And so you know, talking to some of those um, you know, upper class men and women who are taking on these leadership roles within the housing units as identifying maybe some potential faculty that they might have in class or they might have had a, a, a chat with in the hallway or those sorts of things. I mean, these the students uh, at that point, they've probably been living um, living on campus in the, in the residence halls for two or three years, and so they're going to know what, what goes on, and they might potentially be able to identify uh, some of those faculty members that might be good matches uh, with their dorms and with other things that are going around with them, too. So bringing students in and bringing those voices in, I think, uh, would be a, a very beneficial uh, for, for the programs. And I, I don't know that I have too much to add to this, except that I think that um, in terms of the creation of it, you know, you have to match as best you can, I think, faculty's gifts and talents, as we've talked about, with the needs and wants of the uh, individual residence halls. Um, some, you know, like I said, in our FIC situation, some want more direction. They want more um, information about the program they're, gonna, they're interested in and they're entering, and um, maybe some hands-on experiential stuff. Uh, they come over to our lab for uh, you know, an evening and play around with all of our simulators and that sort of thing. But then others, you know, in the more general um, focused interest or in the more general um, living situation where they're not necessarily segregated by major or interest, they may want something that's like a service project or uh, you know, something more along the lines of a, a more social atmosphere. So I think matching that is really important and understanding what your goals are with this program um, because I think that there as we've talked about, it can be very different based on the type of school you have and based on the type of residence hall uh, environment that you've created. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next question, um, and this is for uh, Michael and Ann. How would you like to be recognized for your service as a faculty fellow? I like the free t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody does. Yeah, I, I have to say I have received more nice accolades from the housing department uh, here on campus than I have from my own department in many <laughs> and from many other areas of my life so um, I, I think I do I do it and I have done it because I enjoy it so you really don't have to give us anything but it is nice to get a thank you note um, the students have written me thank you notes and that's probably the most meaningful um, 
but it's nice to get a t-shirt just to show that you, and something that you can wear to identify yourself when you go to events so that they know you're the faculty fellow uh, in some cases that that's helpful. Okay. Um, and for uh, Lisa and Thad, where do you see opportunities for collaboration with academic entities such as Faculty Senate to encourage more faculty involvement in student life programs? You want to take this one first, Lisa? Sure. Um, I think one of the things um, that universities are all um, really talking about right now is retention. Um, and I, th I think we've got some good support that's showing um, that residence life plays a role in student retention. And when this is something that the academic side is discussing, I think it is something uh, worthwhile um, in combining those efforts. Um, specifically, I know when we were talking about recognition for services, I think most of us who do this program, um, we would rather get those thank you notes, as Ann said, from the students that's, that say, you know, after having lunch with you and doing some programs with you, I just wanted you to know that I was comfortable going to my professor's office and asking questions. And I think we're more interested sometimes in, in those academic outcomes. Um, that come toward that. So I think the opportunities lie with some, some very focused kind of outcome or objective-based um, needs that the university has recognized, re retention being one off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, I admittedly don't can't speak too much, too much to the faculty senate, um, but I think, yeah, things like that, not the nitty-gritty details of how the housing stuff runs, but retention would be a good thing, and just along those lines, I think one role that Something with like the faculty senate could play is something we said a couple of times throughout the this, uh, throughout the session is knowledge and just knowing what the, the faculty like the faculty fellow or the housing programs can do uh, for students and getting that advertisement of that knowledge out there. I mean, I think that would be probably the role you would get the most out of with the collaboration like faculty senate. Just knowing, you know, the having the faculty know and getting that message out there that you know that a difference can be made within this uh, within this housing program. So yeah, not the nitty gritty stuff, but I think once again, sort of the big picture, mm -hmm. we can make a difference in, in these areas and that knowledge. This is Anne. I'd like to add just one other comment. Um, Lisa mentioned um, the retention aspect, and, and in Illinois, we're looking obviously at pay for performance coming down the road. In order for these programs to be successful and to continue, um, it would not surprise me that we would have to justify the outcomes from our involvement as faculty and our time as faculty. So if you're designing a program or if you already have one, adding some objective measures, um, outcome measures to your plan uh, would be wise if not uh, necessary going forward. Mm -hmm. Now we have uh, some time to open up questions to um, the attendees of the webinar. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the questions tab. Um, so if you would like to submit questions, um, and I will go ahead and ask them. Dan, do you see a couple questions that have already been submitted? Yeah. Yeah, I see a couple now. Great. Um, okay, as a faculty member, do you have a particular outcome that you are looking for in involvement? Um, and are there any specific learning objectives? And this can go to anybody. I would say for, this is Lisa, for one thing that I'm, that I always look to be an outcome is simply increased engagement. Uh, in academia, in the academy as a whole, whether it's the ability for students to feel comfortable asking questions and answering questions in the classroom, um, some of those um, smaller connections, it, uh, Michael talked about those informal times, um, and in, you know, if you're having a meal with your residents or, or doing something like that, um, you know, where you have students who come in and say, yeah, I, I heard you were a grant writer and I'm, we're thinking of writing a grant for the hall. Could you help me with that? Some type of engagement, I think, it is what I look for uh, out of the program. Okay, and I would agree with that. I mean, I don't have any formal requirements or any formal objectives per se, but I think, you know, kind of the things we've talked about, you know, just 
com the the comfort factor, knowing that you know uh, that professors are, are there for them, and not just within the context of faculty fellows, but <clears throat> even outside of that context. Um, and then you know being engaged, like I think uh, what Lisa was saying, being engaged. So nothing formal, but I think um, it's it's one of those things you can just see when people take to the program. You could see the um, you can see the involvement, and, and you can see sort of the increased comfortable nature and, and, and being able to interact. And I think, you know, sure, that's not going to happen for everyone, but I think that's just one of those things that when you're doing these informal activities, when you're doing these volunteer events, I think engagement and, and sort of sense of comfort is, is really what you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, in general, what would you say are the most common negative misconceptions about student affairs and residence life among faculty who are not involved? And then how can we go about to debunk these? Oh, I don't talk to this faculty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one, I'll just speak to, I think one misperception, I don't know if this is exactly what's being asked, but uh, of, of the the process in general is that it takes up a ton of time <laughs> and that it's it's going to be just all time consuming, um, and it's not. I mean, you there you can work around schedules, you can work with the RA. Um, how do you debunk it? I think it's tough. I think just word of mouth, sort of a grassroots program in terms of you know letting people know that it's 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 fun, it's interactive, and it's really not going to consume you know, uh, inordinate amounts of your time. I think it's the, one of the big stereotypes, at least about working uh, with housing as a, as a faculty member. Okay. If there was one thing you could change about residence life or our approach, what would it be? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand what they, the question means, if they approach to faculty, approach to working with a faculty fellow? Um, I would say approach when working with faculty. Um, I mean, I don't have any complaints personally. I think being sensitive to that issue of time. Um, I don't think that um, here at SAUE they put overburdensome, you know, they don't overburden us with requirements or, or expectations. Um, so I, I feel that's not a problem here, but to be careful of that. Um, I think that you know, having someone who's excited to work with faculty um, and who are, and then setting up the positive relationships with faculty and RAs. And then if there is a mismatch for whatever reason, um, identifying that as soon as possible and either getting them together to fix that or maybe rematching another faculty member as soon as possible. Okay, we actually did get the clarification too, um, and they were looking for how how um, residence life uh, staff members communicate to faculty members. So, um, what change um, would you like to see, um, or change in our approach would you like to see in the ways that we communicate with you? If there is a change, I I, I really had much problem with them. Maybe I'm just lucky, but um, I mean, sure, things are going to, people get busy and, and, and you know, communication is going to break down from time to time, but I think just, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that my RAs or housing staff haven't done this, but something just to always keep doing is, you know, keeping in mind, I know everyone's busy, but keeping in mind the faculty are busy as well, and sort of working with schedules and being flexible about, you know, organizing things in terms of when and where and that type of thing. But uh, like I said, it's not, not something I've run into a real problem with, but it's something that always, you know, that you know, I try to keep in mind for other people as well and that you know, everyone should just keep in mind in general. I think there's never over-communication. Um, you know, it's, and I really like the idea that was brought up earlier. I think, Lisa, you brought it up that somebody um, from your floor sends you an, a newsletter. Yes. That would be wonderful um, to get from my uh, floor every month just because, you know, I can't sometimes go to everything, but to know what's going on. And if I could contribute in other ways, um, you know, that might be something I could elect to do on my own and not, um, you know, wouldn't have to necessarily be constricted by a date or a time. I could, you know, send a message, send a card. I could, um, you know, contribute in some other way besides physically being present. Well, on our... 
I was going to say, our, my RAs are also, in the digital age, really good about putting photos in there so that it helps me put a face to names mm -hmm. to what everyone is doing, and that, that's made a huge difference for me. Okay, thank you. How do you, as the faculty members, approach issues with students that seem less engaged? Do you email them one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, or how else would you um, kind of try to re-engage them, and then how do you know when this has happened? I don't think email. I don't think email. I don't think I email. I think it's one of those things. Well, how do how do I know it's happened? Well, I don't. I don't know that I can formalize that. You can just tell when students start coming coming to events, and you can just generally don't or just apathetic to you know the events and things like that. You can just sense that. In terms of how do you handle that? Well, I mean, it's a delicate balance because yeah, you want to put forth the effort, and the way I would typically do that is just talk to them a little more. You know, just a more personal type of thing and, and try to you know, have a conversation with them and talk. But at the same time, I mean, you have other students as well that are interested, so it's always a delicate balance between how much time do you spend trying to you know, reinvest someone versus you know, spend time with people that, that are there and really want to be motivated. So it's, it's tricky, but I mean, uh, once you sense that you do make an effort, um, and some people take to and some people don't, keep it in mind that everybody's going to have bad days and bad you know, weeks and bad semesters and, and just do whatever you can sort of on an informal basis. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, in terms of the more impromptu events or programs as opposed to kind of the year-long tradition uh, faculty residential life per relationship programs, uh, what sort of approach or timelines, directions, et cetera, do you prefer when RAs request your involvement for an event? Um, more specifically, what's the best way for an RA to request collaboration with a faculty member for an event in their hall? I would say, first of all, in person. I, I for a, an email with a student, I like myself. I like to. I like it when that student arrives during my office hours and and has bothered to look those up and then comes in and introduces themselves so that we can meet kind of in that one-on-one -on -one to know each other's face as we are continuing to communicate uh, over something. So that that's something that um, that has been impressive to me with the students who've contacted me for impromptu events. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I don't think, I mean, just in person would be great. Just, you know, impromptu, you can't sometimes control those things. Obviously, the more time, the better, knowing in advance. But um, once again, I go back to what I said earlier, just being flexible and being knowledgeable. That, you know, sometimes we, we, we can't attend events and just being knowledgeable of that and just keeping up on top of things and offering a lot of events so that we do, if there's something we can't attend or something we can't do, that there are other options. And, you know, tracking that relationship between the, the faculty fellow and the, the RA or the housing staff such that they're working in cooperation to create these events, these volunteer events or these, you know, these housing events. Okay, thank you. Um, are there stereotypes of faculty that you would like um, us to debunk? <laughs> we yeah, don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I was going to say we got seven minutes left. It's like that. I'm not taking this one. I'll just to take this one first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say something that we um, talk about a lot in, in our department and with the faculty and other departments that I talk about is this kind of us versus them. And I think this is one of the best things that the faculty fellow program does is that, and I, and I explain to my students, I don't want to fail you um, because then you sit again when you retake my class in the third row hating me from there. I would rather you pass, get a great grade, and, and go away <laughs> and like me from afar or take another one of my classes. And so I, I think it is that us versus them. We don't meet in the copy room and plan to put all of our tests in the same week. We don't get joy uh, when students fail. Um, that, that from our side, I think, of the classroom, we have a tendency to see this as a partnership in education more than I think the students often see it as a partnership. Sure, and I'll just say one quick thing with that. I think a lot of the times, I mean, you will have faculty. I mean, faculty are people, so you're going to get, you know, a student's going to get a bad faculty member. And it's sort of like a psychological thing. Once they see it happen once, they're just going to latch onto that, and they're going to look for things that confirm that. 
And and just like you, like what she was saying, I mean, just being being aware that most faculty aren't like that, and we we have you know, students' best interests in mind. And at the same time, we're not going to back down and make things simple, but we always, you know, most of us always have good intentions in terms of uh, education and, and and so forth. This is uh, this is Michael. I'm going to chime in. My microphone wasn't working there for a few minutes, so I apologize for for missing out. But I want to just wanted to add to this point that. Uh, you know, EIU and I know a lot of uh, institutions around the area, especially um, uh, are teaching institutions and faculty, I, and I'll speak for myself, come to these places because we want to be educators and we want to be teachers. And that is not just confined to four walls of a classroom and whatever class you get to teach. And I teach statistics. And, you know, it's the most popular uh, class ever. <laughs> um, which makes it hard to connect with students sometimes, but you know, but as a faculty member, I realize that it's not just uh, the subject matter in that classroom that that I have to be involved in in the lives of my students, and I think that um, you, you know getting students to realize that we care about them, or at least you know, I care about them as people as well. Uh, is an important thing for helping debunk that myth. And uh, I know that there are, are some faculty members that I've had conversations with that don't see really the same way that I do, but, you know, we're not all like that. And uh, we keep our doors open, and we walk up and down the halls just to see students to make sure they're doing okay. And the more that we can do that, the more that we can break some of that down. Okay. Um, well, this about wraps up the uh, webinar for today. Um, I would like to thank um, all of our panelists for sharing their insights and um, for being able to give us some of their time today. Um, I know that both Vicki and I very much appreciate it and we took copious amounts of notes um, on our end. Um, as for the attendees, I hope that this was helpful in your current faculty programs um, and that it um, provides some information for progress um, towards your future endeavors on your own campuses. Um, kind of a last uh, kind of a plug for the Student Learning Committee. Um, if you're looking for more opportunities to get involved or work with initiatives such as um, faculty fellows um, or just working with faculty members or just student learning in general, um, consider joining the Glucujo Student Learning Committee this next year. Um, and with that, um, that concludes our webinar for today. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank it. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Enjoyed participating and meeting you all. Thank you, Anne. Thank you.